Dune. Uh, the spice okay. must flow. <laughs> I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be. Uh, um, Pilot whispering. <laughs> I'm gonna be whispering inner monologues throughout the entire episode. Uh, but. Uh, Oh boy. All right. Um, yeah. So we're here. Uh, not that bad is back. <laughs> <laughs> not that bad is back. Uh, with another I'm sorry. Is all that here. whispering annoying? Is it kind uh, of getting intrusive and kind of interrupting the flow? I'm sorry. Uh, at least yours is written a little better. Anyways, um, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's discuss Dune. This is of course, not that bad. Uh, I am one of your co-hosts. My name is Connor, AKA insert made up nonsense sci-fi name here. Uh, don't want to come up with one. Uh, clearly my efforts may have been better than, than that of the Dune story. Uh, I know that it was a book beforehand, so I'm not going to criticize too much, but, uh, Gabe, of course, you are my illustrious co-host, Mr. Gabe Tice. Uh, how are you doing today, my friend? Uh, you couldn't come up with something better than Duncan Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> or how about how about the hero? Are Paul? we really are we settling <laughs> right out the gate? Uh, seriously, Dune. Uh, I can't think of a more prestigious science fiction property that has worse names, like across the board, uh, yeah. th than Dune. Okay, I'm doing. Good. I'm doing fine. <laughs> you didn't. You're uh, not convincing me. <laughs> I just finished watching uh, the movie that we're here to discuss. Uh, too, the movie kinda... I picked, by yeah. the way. The movie you did I picked. Pick this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, obviously it's very topical. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you can't you can't blame me. Uh, of course, no, can't. Dune no. Part Two has just come out. It's you know it's gotten the rave reviews of the uh of dune part one and is surpassing its yeah previous box office success i mean it's really looking to become everything uh the fans of the novel wanted they wanted right uh an adaptation worthy of the epic reputation uh, of the original dune novel uh i'm trying to set up some context for uh for Dune 1984, and it's uh, a really inexplicable movie to me. Okay, let's actually attack it from a different angle altogether. Okay, okay. I, I did right. not pick this movie because of my affinity for for Dune, the franchise. I have read the book. I've now read uh, the sequel book, Dune Messiah, and I plan to okay. uh, continue reading the novels because uh, I'm a I'm a casual fan. The reason I want to talk about Dune 1984 is because it is directed by David Lynch, uh, one it of is. my favorite directors, okay. one of, I think, the most compelling directors alive today, one of the most, uh, you know, he's the premier surrealist. He's an interesting dude. <laughs> to say With an the interesting least. interesting vision, yeah, yeah. And this comes at such uh, a pivotal moment in his career, Dune comes at a pivotal moment in his career. So he has, uh, this is his first, no, I'm sorry, it's his third feature film. It's his first in color. He had done Eraserhead and The Elephant Man prior yes. to this. And then Dino De Laurentiis hires him to direct Dune. Now, famously, there were several failed attempts to adapt Dune, uh, most notoriously, uh, Jodorowsky's Dune, you know, Jodorowsky, uh, another surrealist who wanted to adapt Dune. And there's a whole documentary about it. It's maybe the most famous uh, science fiction movie never made. I think the jury's still out over whether or not he would have, whether or not it would have been a good adaptation of Dune. Right. Uh, not really a conversation I'm interested in having, frankly. But so, uh, let me toss it to you. Uh, what's your relationship to David Lynch, if you have one? Um, uh, so, okay. Um, I guess I'm a bit of a hot take artist when it comes to David Lynch. Oh, no. Uh, I'm a bit, I, look, uh, I like the Twin Peaks. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I like the Twin Peaks, uh, and I, and I uh, enjoy Eraserhead mostly. Uh, but that's about it oh, for me. Oh no! I know. Oh, I'm not a David Lynch guy, and and you know that that um, I've I've always felt sort of like I bully myself for it. You know, like everything about David Lynch seems like something that I would just eat up. Um, 
you know, similar filmmakers or, or filmmakers who do kind of similar things. I kind of feel like I enjoy, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the hype. I, I do tend to be somebody who's greatly affected by like, if, if somebody comes to me and they tell me something is the greatest or it's the best, that's what I'm going to expect when I watch it. Um, and I'm going to do my best to manage it. Is but, that what people you know, have done to you for David Lynch? Have people you, hyped him up to that degree? Yes. When I was getting into mm. movies, they were like, this guy is the best. He is, he, his movies are some of the greatest pieces of film you will ever see in your life. And I was like, yeah, I mean, he's like, he's a good director. He's got a great vision. I think his, his, the, uh, you know, his visuals are, are fantastic. And once he did start making movies that were in color, they look great. I mean, the color palettes are great and everything. Okay. Um, I resent that comment. I, I mean, you don't think that Eraserhead and the no, Elf Man are gorgeously photographed I think they, movies? I think they look great in black and white. Um, what I'm saying is once he introduced color, his color palette really complemented the way. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so it, it wasn't one of those things of where like his transition was awkward or anything. Like it felt like even this, movie, it was awkward in this movie, which we'll get to. I but... don't know if I agree. I thought this movie looked really good uh, as far as the, the visual and, and you know, the visual aspect of this movie, I thought was its strongest point. I think if you're seeing this movie in 1984 and you know, David Lynch from his first two movies, I do think it looks like a smooth transition at that moment. But when I think of his color palettes, I think of Blue Velvet, I think right. of Twin Peaks, you know, the Red Room. He has a vibrant, really high contrast sense of color. It's like this bizarro world technicolor that really defines his aesthetic for me in the yeah. realm of, of color film. And Dune is is lacking in that, uh, not to already start giving away my thoughts on the, on the final <laughs> film, but... Uh, I'll, I'll come at it from the opposite angle. I've always been really enamored with David Lynch. And I, I am aware that there is this kind of a film bro hype behind his name that I think is off-putting to people. And yeah. I mean, just the film bro, film bros are killing a lot of these classic uh, and these established directors. I think that right. you're seeing that effect somewhat on even Martin Scorsese, you know? I think the sense of uh, of gatekeeping and authority on good taste surrounding these uh, these Mount Rushmore directors, it's really unfortunate. So I'm not going to tell you that David Lynch is the greatest director. You know, he's not the greatest surrealist. He's not the greatest anything. That's not the conversation I want to have around David Lynch. But right. what I've always admired about this man is... Uh, Obviously, his films tend to be non-linear and abstract, but it's always in service of expression. And he's not weird for the sake of weird. Eraserhead, you know, there's such a boring uh, kind of angle on David Lynch that both, uh, you know, his admirers and detractors talk about that. He is just crazy. Like, <laughs> whoa. Whoa, man! You know, this kind of like acid trip on film—that's yeah. not him. He is uh, the most straight-laced uh, Boy Scout of a human being um, working in Hollywood. <laughs> you know, he <laughs> he doesn't do drugs. He does transcendental meditation, right? He he says things like shucks and golly, and likes <laughs> apple pie. He is honestly. The, the character he's created that is closest to his personality is probably Dale Cooper from Twin Peaks. But no, he's always about expression and uh, uh, putting emotions, the most, um, the most abstract emotions or the most uh, high level emotions onto celluloid, onto film. Uh, I say celluloid, he actually prefers shooting digital to film. So He's not a film bro. Like he never even grew up wanting to be a filmmaker. He wanted to be a painter. And then through a series of happy accidents, he, you know, he gets a grant from AFI to make a series of shorts and then Eraserhead. And yeah. from that, he gets hired to do Eraserhead. And his whole career is one of happy accidents. There's only a few times where he sort of takes the reins um, and, and kind of boldly goes forward with his own idea. I mean, a lot of his movies are reactions to circumstance like blue velvet. I think a movie that's like a lot of people's favorite David Lynch movie or one of his most, most famous, like, have you seen blue velvet? 
I have, yes. It, do, do you like that one? It's fine. Really? Okay. Yeah. I've never heard a middling response to Blue Velvet. It's famously a love or hate kind of thing, but okay. It's, it's fine. Yeah. But, I, I mean, I think it's just because like, I, I probably would have really enjoyed it if again, like I had, I had several, not just like one dude who was just film broing me with David Lynch. It yeah. was like several people as I was getting more into like, you know, as I was getting more into film told me all of this. So then I just kept it in my mind every single time I put on a film of his, I think this was actually the first movie that I saw of him where like, I knew my opinion of David Lynch going into it. I knew, you know, he was not necessarily like hit or miss for me, but like that he wasn't to me what he is to all these other people apparently. Uh, so like I, I didn't, I, I had reasonable expectations when going into this. This was probably the first movie I've given a fair chance to well, from him. You know, talking about expectations, this is uh, this has the reputation of being his worst movie. Uh, you know, the movie he was most miscast to make, uh, a movie that he should not have made. Uh, I mean, now let's shift gears. I guess talking about about Dune, the movie from nineteen eighty four. Uh, it's you know, before I saw it, you know, I knew of its reputation as being uh this kind of tragic accident of of science fiction uh it, it, like it's like this abomination um that was the product of like malfeasance uh they they get the wrong director and the studio uh interferes with his with his um you know ability to make the movie they famously made him uh trim this epic novel and when i say epic i mean like it is dense and rich with subplots characters <laughs> lore it took me a really long time to get through that that first book it, it is just uh there, there is a real textual density to it and they made him trim that down to a little over two hours you know whereas denis villeneuve he took two near three hour movies for that one book and he still had to cut things out he still had to cut out major things that fans complained about like how could you leave that out and ironically david lynch actually includes some of those things so we'll get into the the differences there but again it is like when i first saw it there was not really a cult following or defenders now there actually does seem to be you know at least a school of uh of thought that um either goes easy on this movie or even defends it. I mean, some people actually, you know, have called it underrated. Some have called it a masterpiece. Some have um, tried to recontextualize it as being this really glor like this triumph for David I Lynch. see it categorized a lot now, especially like the last few years as, as a bit of a cult classic is what I've seen. Definitely, definitely. And that's partly because of, uh, of time and distance. You know, right. people... Um, the, the outrage I think has just died down and it's also the life cycle for a movie like this right and mm. we see this in horror all the time this black sheep it, it's it's um persona non grata it is exiled or it, it, it's hated detested right and then another adaptation comes out and through that contrast I guess however this happens people get nostalgic for that previous adaptation or they uh, they realize things about it that they took for granted. With Dune 1984, a lot of people really appreciate actually the uh, the flagrant weirdness of it. Because <laughs> with Denis Villeneuve, if you're familiar with him as a director, you know, he takes a more grounded approach. He takes uh, not a sterile approach. No. Al although I think his... Uh, his color palette and his visual style is a little bit more um, monochromatic for, for my taste. Like, oh, okay, you know, Arrakis really just looks like just a desert. It really doesn't have any kind of um, alien flair to it. Not something you can accuse do 1984 of. It feels like it was made by an alien. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sometimes yeah, there 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 were a few shots. I will I will say I was a little disappointed with how it didn't go as crazy as I thought. Like when you look up Dune, uh, nineteen eighty four, you see this poster with like these pinks and purples and like right. these 
big blue planets in the sky and you're like, oh, this is going to be like the most like surreal, cosmic, fucking crazy sci-fi movie. And then it's not really that. But the visuals are, I said it a little earlier, I kind of telegraphed it. It's my favorite part of the movie. Um, that was the part that I enjoyed the most. Well, it's what the movie has going visual for style. it. It's what yeah. the movie has going for it. I think uh, even detractors will probably concede to that. And it's what David Lynch was hired to do. I mean, the logic must have been David Lynch, this uh, this visionary, he can take these absurd, bizarre, eccentric ideas, ideas that seem filmable to other people and conceptualize it uh, and mold it, you know, and mm -hmm. put and, and photograph it. Yeah. Uh, and And they're not wrong. And maybe if it weren't for the accursed interference from the studio, from producers, we would have seen a really untamed, a really uh, audacious vision from David Lynch. But, you know, the man himself hates this movie. He regrets <laughs> making it, or at least he regrets making it in the sense that he, he, is, he disowns the final product. Now, I actually wrote uh, a piece about Dune 1984 for my Substack. Um, if we're not busy <laughs> plugging ourselves too much, yeah. And I didn't talk about the, the actual film in it. What I talk about is its its place in David Lynch's career. And I argue it saved his career because if it had succeeded, it would have derailed uh, his true passion for the surreal and the strange. And it would have made him, you know, like uh, some kind of, you know, George Lucas type. And, you know, to make this all even more bizarre in context, before taking the job to do Dune, <laughs> he turned down the job to do return of the jedi and i mean it was such yeah. a it, it, it was something he was so not interested in doing return of the jedi that he he got a migraine famously just talking to george lucas about the job so i don't know why he took dune he ignored his instincts and decided to try his hand at being you know the next uh the next steven spielberg or what have you and you know it, it failed and he um has stuck to his guns and has trusted himself and only himself ever since i gotta give him credit for that i mean i you know i'd like to think that um you know despite my my personal feelings like the guy's a legend and he knows what he's doing behind the camera and um you know seeing a movie like this and watching it um it does feel a little out of place i i think you know i'd, I'd like to think that it, it's sort of one of those things where it's like all right well if i if i do this it, and you know it works out really well i'm not really gonna have to ask for, you know i'm not really gonna have to ask for anything you know in the yeah. future you know it's, it's some some people reach a point where they just don't have to can I get some more money to make this or, 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 you know, uh, you know, I'm really struggling on time here to make this movie. Like, you know, we're, we're running low on days here. You know, some directors just reach a point where that doesn't matter anymore and they just get to make whatever the hell they want and studios put it out. And that's, that's what happens. And so maybe, you know, I could see it being an angle of like, well, if this pays off, like I can just make whatever I want for, you know, I get a good budget for it. I get the time I need to make it. Um, the only thing I, I think may have been a bit of a miscalculation, at least from that, if, if that was his logic, was if it fails, <laughs> you could have a hard time getting the money you need for your next movie. You could have a hard time getting a good shooting schedule for your next movie that's that's not, you know, super condensed. Um, I mean, uh, we talked about seeing stuff like that in the horror genre. I mean, Rob Zombie is a good example of that. I mean, this guy came out with two movies that were special and unique you know no matter how you felt about them devil's rejects got a lot of praise when it came out and then the dude made the halloween movies and since then he's been getting less money per project he's been getting less time to shoot his projects he's had to crowdfund some of his films and some aspects of his movies um despite being you know in my opinion one of the more talented directors of of you know the genre today so you know, and it's, yeah, it's I, one of those. It's an interesting comparison, right? Rob Zombie to David Lynch. I would describe Halloween 2 as as having Lynchian flares. And Lynchian isn't, it's a word <laughs> in the dictionary now. It that's, is, yes. That's, that's true. how singular of a style he has. You know, Lynchian is something. I would not describe this movie as Lynchian. 
Uh, no, and, and that's probably not. That's the tragedy of, of Dune 1984 is uh, I, I thought I might be able to say, well, it's not a good Dune movie. It, it's not. But it's it's a good David Lynch movie. It's a, it's an interesting David Lynch movie. It's uh, it was at least nice to see him try this. That's not really the feeling I was left with uh, with Dune. But I think we've kind of circled around the actual movie itself for long enough. We should probably really dive in and dissect this as well as we can. I mean, it's a little, <laughs> it's a little really, it, it's hard to parse this movie out. I mean, it, I, you can't call it all bad. I think we should probably start no. with, with the good, right? We've already talked about the visuals specifically. I want, uh, I want to highlight the production design, like the world of yeah. Harkonnen. And this is where, you know, the David Lynch fans will be happiest because, uh, from Eraserhead has carried over that sense of the industrialization of, of humanity and, you know, the dehumanization, the degradation. And that is something that actually I think fits really well into the world of the Harkonnens, right? They're these authoritarians uh, without compassion. I mean, they're, they're comically evil. I mean, they're, they're comedically yeah. evil. I mean, the Baron's just flying around in his little fart suit, cackling evilly. <laughs> yeah. um, insane. <laughs> and God, but something that's that's in this movie, not even in so much of Lynch's other movies. I mean, there are there are cinnabites in this movie. Like the body horror, it it's off the charts, especially on the Arrakis. No, I'm sorry, the Harkonnen uh scenes. I mean, as a horror fan, did you get uh did you get some of that? Def definitely got some. I, I think the thing that was the thing I kept thinking was like there's there's something as far as the production design that was like reminding me of uh of two thousand one a space odyssey. And I don't know if that's because they got the same production designer as that was on two thousand one a space odyssey. Um but uh there was there look there's a lot of feelings that I got throughout watching this um, and a lot of impressions that I got from not only like maybe inspirations that that David Lynch used to kind of put this world together uh, outside of just like what's in the novel. Obviously, I haven't read the novel, so yeah, I don't know how descriptive those things are, but I would assume, you know, with things uh, that I've seen in the trailer for both Dune Part 1 and 2 recently, some of these things must have been described in great detail because they do carry over, at least based on what I've seen, especially with like you know, the design of the worms and things like that. Um, but uh, I, I think it's hard to pinpoint any sort of vibe from this. <laughs> I'm going to be yeah, honest. No, uh, it feels uh, a little all over. It's one of those movies that feels like, um, you know, a battlefield of influences, right? Yes. Whether it be director versus producers or, you know, the, the source material versus the vision. I mean, it is not coherent. Uh, no, no. Which is going to make it pretty impossible to defend as a good movie. I don't, like I said, it's not all bad. Um, it ain't all great. I don't know how many things about it I consider great. You know, let me, let me start though uh, with, with something commendable. I think the cast, you know, David Lynch got himself a great cast. It's this is impressive. his, this is his first collaboration with the, Kyle McLaughlin, he would go on to be in Blue Velvet and most famously Twin Peaks, right? That's, I think, right. a crown jewel for, for him and David Lynch. I've heard people say that his performance as Paul is flat, and I just don't agree. And, and considering this is his first movie, not just his first leading role in a movie, but literally his first movie coming out of acting school, I was really impressed. Like there is real star power here. You know, it's a little, you know, they're a little rough around the edges, maybe. It's not like he he nails it the way uh, a more experienced actor could have, but it is no surprise to me that this guy went on to have a, a real career and and develop his own following. You could definitely see flashes of it. And and I think but I, you know, I think when we talk about the cast, I think uh, who they put together, like you know, it's a surprising amount of talent. Like it's a surprising like, amount. It's pretty random. It's it's very random. I mean, uh, you know, it's not necessarily. Um, 
even then, even in, in the 80s, it doesn't feel like a cast that sort of like makes sense on the surface. Uh, but I think most of it pretty much works. I think where my complaint kind of comes in is that everything good I can say about both the casting and the acting, I have to also say something bad about <laughs> because like much of the rest of the movie, it is very uneven. There is a lot of very strange choices with what's done in the performances. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I think our star here is is the least egregious, to be honest with you. I mean, other than characters who don't get as much screen time, like obviously Sir, Sir Patrick Stewart's not like eating every scene up because he's not in the movie as long as some of these other characters are. Um, but... Uh, I, I, I can't see flat. I can certainly see some scenes where I don't know if he was as comfortable or something just fell off. Um, towards the end of the movie, I didn't notice it as much. I don't know if they filmed that actually later. I don't, I would assume that the stuff that was shot towards the end of the movie, you know, this, this definitely felt like it was shot out of sequence. I don't know. He just felt more comfortable in some scenes towards the end of the film. Uh, but definitely like, the beginning and middle of this movie, I don't know, again, it almost felt like to me it was shot in sequence from how his experience level was because I enjoyed him more at the end of the film. He was about, never mind, I'm not going to say that yet. Um, don't you think uh, that's the hero's journey in effect? I mean, Paul yeah. is uh, going from being uh, a young, naive, uh, you know, heir to the throne, uh, really, uh, you know, is thrust into a situation that's so much more grand and complex than he is. Like, I think uh, I see the uncomfortability and maybe it was Count McLaughlin's own, you know, uncomfortability taking yeah. such a huge role in a huge movie just right out the gate, but it does, you know, fit the character in, in some ways. I think that kind of, that was, that was like a wise casting choice, you know, Timothy Chalamet, who I have a notorious beef with. I, I <laughs> do not like the guy. I don't need to see him in everything. There was a there was a couple of months where he, every trailer had his face in it. You know, yeah. you go to the movie theaters, he's just everywhere. Um, my animosity towards him has died down. And uh, I think he, um, he impressed me more in Dune Part 2 for sure. But uh, something about you know, the movie star, Timothy Chalamet, I think clouds the journey uh, that the Paul Atreides takes. Now, what actually what they do with Paul in this uh, is probably the most egregious change <laughs> and frankly betrayal of the source material. We can get to that later because that's, that's really a discussion in and of itself. But just if you're doing another science fiction, uh, a, a space opera, you want to have your own Luke, Luke Skywalker. I think that there is a, a totally coherent, totally fine character arc here that tracks. Yeah. I mean, there's weird stuff that gets rushed, like his romance right. with, yeah. with Sean Young, but but just the start <laughs> yeah. and end, okay, fine, I accept it. And the performance, uh, it worked. You know, for me, it worked. Yeah. I think overall, um, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of complaints overall. If I had to, uh, if I had to boil it down, <laughs> I don't have a whole lot of complaints. Oh, so are there, for him? are there cast members that you do have complaints about? Dude. Okay. Whoever the fuck, whoever the fuck was playing that, like, I don't know if, if they're considered to be like witches in this world or what. The uh, Benny Jesuits. The last one th that at the end of the movie, you know, where where there's that big confrontation between um, Paul and his crew, and then the what is it, the Emperor and his mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. dude. That was just unbearably terrible. I mean, it, I I I. Who are you talking I was... about? You talking about the <laughs> Benny Jesuit witch? Yes, dude. It was like. So, like, first of all, she has this terrible interaction with like the child. You know, the the uh paul's sister who's born into like these powers that she has they have this terrible interaction when she shows up to kind of like taunt them before paul shows up right and then and then paul's there and having this face off with uh the emperor before he before he kills sting um and she's like dude I, 
if if you don't if you can't pinpoint what i'm referencing as somebody who's freshly watched the movie i hope can just kind of think back to it it was so horrifically terrible for me that i, I almost don't, just stopped i watching. don't see that at all i really can't even i'm not sure i understand what what your complaint with her performances i thought it was oh fine. dude no i i i, mean, I don't know strange. she's playing an intergalactic witch i mean yeah it's, but like it's not relatable I but <laughs> i don't know i maybe it's because there is no frame of reference for for space witch but i just i don't know man there's something about that interaction like i wanted to i wanted to turn the movie off i was i, I was like no i i'm good i don't I don't think I don't think I want to keep watching of this. All the performances I thought you were going to trash on. That was not the one. Can I, really I did not can I assume can I assume one of the performances that you thought I might trash on? Yeah, go for it. Maybe the Baron. So the Baron is uh the best part of this movie. I, I would agree. <laughs> fucking love this guy. He's having I would the agree. time of his life. He's going for it. He um I love it when people allow themselves to be a little extra, you know, and this is, uh, it's a real study in contrast between this performance and Stellan Skarsgård's performance as the Baron in Dune, you know, there he has taken inspiration from Marlon Brando in Apocalypse Now. It's a, it's a threatening performance. It's a pretty menacing one, especially the way he's photographed, um, and the prosthetics given to him, uh, he's really like an ogre of a of a man there but this guy <laughs> oh you tell me man what are the words that come to your mind when when you think about uh baron harkonnen i will make a direct i will make a direct comparison okay to another film that we've covered on this show and that also features actor leonardo chimono or Ch uh, sorry Ch uh, chimino um waterworld uh and i'm going to make that comparison because Ooh, he was in this movie what Dennis Hopper was in Waterworld to me. He is better I, uh, than maybe, Dennis Hopper in Waterworld. Waterworld. I will agree with that. I, yeah. I, I well, mm, I don't know if I'll agree with that. I think what he is is he's a bit more entertaining. Uh, he's just. It felt like the dude did a bump of cocaine before every single shot, uh, and it was it worked tremendous wonders towards this film. I'm going to say something a little bit later. I, I, I broke a rule when watching this movie. One of my own personal rules, I, I hate myself for doing it, but I did. I broke one of my own personal rules while watching this. Uh, I didn't mean to, but I did. Um, this guy was, oh my God, I don't know how to say this without saying something mean about the movie. Fuck, I'm just gonna fucking telegraph how I feel about this right now. This guy was, was the only thing keeping me watching this. <laughs> this guy, I, there was there's other things I enjoyed, don't get me wrong. Um, but every single time this guy was on screen, his his seemingly his his face boils or whatever the hell that was all over him, that that illness was just it it looked bigger or <laughs> worse. Um he was just screaming and laughing the entire movie. Um by far the best character in my mind. I, I not even close. Yeah, the most entertaining, the most watchable, um, gives, just gives the movie the most life. I mean, it, it actually looks like somebody was having fun making this. When my I think scenes, it, if yeah. I could say a distant second for me would would be Brad Dorf. That would be my distant second. Brad Dorf, Brad Dorf is an MVP, as we've yes. established on this show. Yes. Uh, uh, now, how did you like those eyebrows? How much did the eyebrows elevates um, everything? uh it, it carried about 30 percent of his performance <laughs> <laughs> well you know and, actors like to uh, uh, <clears throat> apparently there's such a thing as like a, a top heavy actor like an actor who uses the appliances on their heads whether they be hats or prosthetics really define yeah. their performance and that is something that i yeah. i feel came through uh with for Mr. him Brad and Dorf. that other guy you know the guy that takes uh, that gets taken hostage and then he's yeah. like uh you know he's he's given some kind of poison and they put that thing on him to keep him alive they or give whatever him a cat yeah and they give him a cat what the f they give him a cat oh man oh yeah the animals in this movie <laughs> can i mean they're the real stars okay the the pug that, Dude, that Patrick cat. Stewart takes into battle a cat the, the cat the rat the cow 
The cat is like angry meowing, like, let me fucking go. And they kept it in. Not only did they keep it in, but they recorded over it so that you could hear it better. It was now, incredible. Somebody that we have not mentioned yet is uh, perhaps one of the most famous cast members in the movie, although oh, he's not famous for acting. No, he's not. Uh, no, he's not. Uh, of course, this is one of I see the why. first... <laughs> Hey, okay. I see we're gonna have a fight. Uh, this is this is one of the first performances from Sting, otherwise yeah. known as the front man to the police. I believe they were still together at this time. Yes, Sting, the British singer songwriter Sting. Uh, he plays Bade, um, and by God, he is barely in this movie. I was really surprised. So, so the first thing I thought, again, I have never seen Dune. I've never read the source material. I have no idea who he, who his character is. I went, is that fucking Sting? And I went, oh no, this movie's gonna be all Sting, isn't it? And he wasn't fucking. He was barely there. And when he was there, I was not. I personally was not impressed. But I was so shocked at how <laughs> little he was in this. He's the now, name, right? He was. Uh, hmm. I guess. I mean, I don't know if he was literally the most famous person in this cast i mean i don't think david lynch would have allowed for some for some singer to overshadow well, i mean the, yeah, the rest of it i don't i don't know if it was david lynch's idea or not you know the thing about david lynch too is even though he's weird strange eccentric he is uh he totally embraces pop culture like his ideas like he's almost this kind of sponge for popular culture iconography and influences that he twists and um, some would say perverts into his own image. Like almost all of his songs feature some kind of uh, odes or nods to popular music, pop music, yeah. or some other, you know, he's been compared to Norman Rockwell. And Sting could be one of those things. Now, I, I would find it weird if David Lynch was was like that big of a fan of of the police. It's not really his thing. Maybe he's more into to white reggae than than I realize. <laughs> but okay, Sting is in this movie barely. Uh, people remember that he's in this movie because of that epic bulge that he displays. <laughs> so proudly <laughs> and his little space speedo oh my god dude's walking with his like you know he's like he like he does he does that walk when they're trying to accentuate that area where it's like his back is like shaped like a cane or something it's terrible man it's terrible now, i hated it i'm gonna disagree with you i actually oh, think man. that sting quite impressively given his limited screen time actually <laughs> shows some some acting chops, some charisma. Some charisma, sure. <laughs> charisma, I mean, hello, he's got the confidence to walk out there with his package full on display. That yeah. is, that takes a certain level of confidence. <laughs> I, suppose, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. I would I, do it. <laughs> I wish he was in the movie more. I actually think, I think he could have uh, given the movie another boost. He's an actual foe, a foil for Paul. They don't really play that in this movie at all compared to they, the book or yeah. the Villeneuve version. It felt like much of his stuff, I don't know if it was cut or if it just wasn't included in the script, but like when it got to the point where they had like the one-on-one -on -one fight, I, I got the impression that that was supposed to be much more impactful than it was. Um, it Absolutely. just felt kind of out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, obviously it, it lets the movie end on a fight between two equals, uh, you know, two two fighting equals, but... One of my favorite scenes in the new Villeneuve version is Fade's big entrance, his big uh, introduction, where he does this whole gladiator combat with uh, three Who prisoners. plays Fade in the new one? Uh, Austin Butler. Elvis oh, Presley really? Himself. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's a big role. It was a coveted role. Like, this is one of the, like, famous characters from the novel, and they... They thought it would be a good opportunity for some famous person, some famous actor or singer or what have you in Dune yeah. 84. But uh, for some reason, he is one of the characters and elements that suffers the most from the, the trimming of the source material. 
Now, uh, I don't know if you know a lot of background. I'm just curious if you if you know this. Was that was that mostly on like the editing floor, or was that uh, something that like David Lynch just didn't put into the script? So there are deleted scenes, and there has been a rumor of an extended cut. I believe there was an extended television version that I've never seen. David Lynch had no involvement with that. Okay. Uh, he hates this movie so much that he would never <laughs> go back to do any sort of new cut or new version. He just wants to leave it behind. But okay. there are deleted scenes. Uh, how much? Uh, it's certainly not enough to make up for all of the uh, things that were cut out of the book. You know, again, he was pressured to make a, uh, a movie under two and a half hours. So okay. yeah. there, there's certainly deleted material. I don't know if, for example, um, the, the scene I just talked about could be one of them. I doubt it. Uh, it, you know, if I was a bigger fan of this movie, I would have tracked that down. But you know. I, I was curious more so as like a because I know I know you like David Lynch and I know that you know like you said ca kind of a casual Doom fan. Um, I'm a I'm I'm honestly shocked I haven't seen these uh, these two recent Doom movies because Denis Villeneuve is hey, he made one of my favorite movies of all time uh, and and a movie I consider perfect. Um, What's that? And I, uh blade runner 2049 not perfect not uh, perfect for perfect. me All perfect right. for me loved right. it loved it. every single minute of it uh it is one of my favorite films ever um loved it uh do you like I, it more than the original absolutely yeah i, I think the original is fantastic but um, I, I just don't get that i i saw blade runner 2049 um and may, may, there's a good two-hour movie in that thing uh but man uh, yeah him getting cast to ad adapt dune kind of made me worry at that news because i didn't think he would be able to rein in the wildness of dune i mean you cannot put that whole thing <laughs> in theaters and expect it to make money it is i mean it's going to alienate people like on mass uh but i think he did rein it in but uh my, my big gripe with Blade Runner 2049 is actually that it pretty blatantly rips off um, a movie I consider perfect, which is Her, the Spike Jones movie starring Joaquin Phoenix. There is a scene straight out of Her. Straight out of okay. Her. Okay. You know, I haven't, I haven't seen Her, and I'm not a huge... Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not going to see it either, so... <laughs> okay. I'm, a, I'm just going to keep my Blade Runner 2049 perfect in my keep head. Keep your pure... Yeah. blissful experience with Blade Runner 2049. I will, I will not that. try to take yeah. that away from you. I'll do uh, that. Um, uh, no, I do want to ask you about uh, about one about one choice in this movie. Um, because I was a little confused and I don't know <laughs> I don't know if it's a movie thing or if this is how the Dune story is. So Sean Young's character uh is she Shawnee. supposed to be more important in because i i know she was like relatively important once like they got to that point but so much of her story especially with um with paul just like it's just glazed over like there's there's this one portion of the movie it's where they just glazed over they just kind of give up yeah. and they're just like they just do this like not even a montage but they just do this like voiceover where they're like for the next two years and they tell you about what transpired between this period of time and all they say in that whole thing is that paul and and was it's shawnee is, is her name mm -hmm. paul and shawnee's love grew deeper and then they they, they they move on past and it's like she is she feels like she's supposed to be this like <laughs> like joining him at the at the helm of the society that they're building and it she doesn't she doesn't feel that way well i mean i think you answered it yourself i mean it's glaringly uh pretty uh pretty blatantly um glossed over in, in the movie i yeah. mean they they were really struggling uh by the point that paul joins up with the fremen to to fit this book into a single movie i wonder if the idea even even came to them of doing a two-parter uh I guess that was not a there there were exceptions but that really wasn't um a, a sellable idea the way it is now so I, I probably did not come to them but 
uh, Johnny, perfect example of another element that really gets lost in the shuffle here. Uh, I mean, she still serves her purpose. She's Paul's lover. Um, I struggle to remember this in the book so much, but Zendaya's performance of that character and their relationship is actually one of the highlights of the new Villeneuve adaptations. I figured. Yeah, and it's... Um, it's actually hard to talk about her without talking about, again, I think the most problematic change um, of Dune 84 as an adaptation. So do you want to get into that? Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to hear this because I'm not super familiar. So I'll be learning here. <laughs> so what makes an adaptation good um, to me is not the number of things that you manage to include from the source material. You know, it's not the number of subplots not the number of characters, not the Easter eggs. Uh, I mean, it's nice if you are able to include those things. And as a fan, it can certainly be disappointing if you see it removed. But right. frankly, that's not the mission or the job of an adaptation. It is to translate the source material to a new medium and preserving those core elements that creates the experience of, uh, of having... Um, gone through this text you know what i mean it's it's it, yeah. it's translation it's not a lateral move so the the real flaw here for dune 84 and i'm not even going to blame entirely on on the movie itself and I'll explain that um as i go on but paul muadib is not supposed to be a messiah figure in the book in the series canonically he is more of an antichrist he is a false prophet um the product of of you know genetic engineering obviously you know the controlling of bloodlines and you know taking advantage of of native mythology and these colonized people you know and he's an opportunist and maybe he has benevolent intentions but Ultimately, he is a false prophet. Whereas in the 84 version, oh boy, the, the Jesus shit, the, the Messiah complex of this whole movie and the reverence it has for Paul. I mean, it's not just, it's like, I, it, let me now backtrack because I was about to blast the movie, but actually the truth is, that the original novel was not as clear about this as I think uh, people remember. And actually it's the sequel, Dune Messiah, that I think really clarifies this and really hammers this home. And now it, it's something that um, Dune fans talk about a lot all the time. Like to them, it's one of the core philosophies of the Dune saga is do not trust false prophets. Do not trust leaders. It's anti-authority. But I would argue that Frank Herbert felt the need to write Dune Messiah to clarify that because I think, honestly, a lot of people missed that from the original text. So it's not even entirely the movie's fault. It still feels pretty egregious to me because if you did take a very careful uh, look at the source material, you could uh, see the disparity between, between that text and this adaptation. But, you know, it's like it's like getting to the end of return of the king and learning that you know in the movie they actually make sauron you know the good guy at the end you know what i mean like it's like it's almost like that level of misunderstanding of the actual essentials of the story so as somebody who you know has not read the book hasn't seen the villeneuve movies hearing what i just said how does that influence, um, I guess, this movie for you? And do you wish that you could have seen that version play out? Um, so, well, before I say that, let me just ask this to kind of nail it down for me. Mm -hmm. So is they bring up this this uh, thought of the prophecy and like sort of like a chosen one type thing. Is that a story in the book? It just turns out that Paul's really not that or is that introduced as a storyline of the movie in its entirety? So in the book, there is a prophecy, but that prophecy was actually written 
I think by the Benny Jesuits. I, I might be getting the details wrong, but that's okay. another piece of engineering to create um, the, the ability of, of the higher powers, the upper class to control the Fremen. You know, it, it's it. okay. using mythology to, you know, it's an allegory for religion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Marx called it the opium of the masses, a way to control, subdue, and manipulate uh, this class of people. And Paul uses it um, to, you know, gain control over them. He uses them as an army to get revenge on Baron Harkonnen and take the throne. The throne. So it is technically in the novel, but they've actually used it um, unironically. They've taken it at face value in the movie. Got it. Okay, I, I felt like they gave, you know, the Paul's army, you know, that he cultivates his his cult, if you will, the cult of Paul. But they treat it like um, it's his right. It's almost his birthright, you know. It, they, they do. I, I think the thing that I appreciated about it a little bit was that Paul, um, it, like the, the, these people had a reason to join the fight. It wasn't completely out of the realm of, of normalcy for them to be doing what they're doing. It wasn't like, you know, their lives were completely altered by the fact that this guy showed up and now they're all going to follow him into battle because he's just there. I appreciated that much, but I felt like it, like so much of it was, it almost felt like out of place for a movie like this. Uh, when you, when you watch a movie that's very sci-fi driven, you'll see sometimes elements of like ancient storytelling or ancient um, sort of philosophies and stuff, like especially in the alien movies, you know, as you get into some of those, like you know, Alien vs. Predator had a lot of it, um, Prometheus had a lot of it, um, but you see this sort of element of like, oh, the ancient side of what, you know, like a future technology era will be. This takes place in like the year 10,000 or something. Um, you know, uh, he, my thought process is it felt a little out of place, you know, like I, I was almost waiting for something to go wrong or... Um, to not pan out because it, it, it felt like your classic tale of here's this magical prophecy, here's the fulfiller of said prophecy, and then everything happens. It comes true the way that it says yeah. in the prophecy. It, is it, it just, just felt a, a little weird. It is just a straight line from Paul joining the Fremen to him, using them to overthrow the emperor. There is intention. There is uh, yeah obstacles. It's... I mean, it is uh, so uh, deprived of the tensions in the book that Villeneuve really captured well in his adaptation. You know, I mean, really the meat of the storyline there is Paul um, integrating into the Fremen who do not want him there. It, it's not like in the movie where they like welcome him immediately. Like it takes uh, time. It takes- uh, That was jarring as hell. When yeah. they, so they show up, and it and and first so paul straight up decks a dude in the face yeah. and um the, what at this point uh, forgive me because um, i'm gonna mention something of, of why i don't exactly remember this a little later but uh was that that was his father at that point or who was he with at that point when he joins his friend and uh yeah he's with his mother oh oh his, mo his mother that's right okay yeah so his mother gets the dude and has him <laughs> With a knife at his throat. Yeah, dead to rights. Yeah. Um, and Paul decks a dude and then like hides behind a rock, mm -hmm. and almost immediately they're like, "We will follow you to the depths of hell." <laughs> You're like, "What the fuck? What do you mean?" <laughs> because they because they beat you. Like what? Because is, they, they think that he's the chosen one. It happens so fast. It's it's like you know the movies cruising along, and then they just pulled the e-brake as fat like in the middle of driving down the highway they just pulled the e-brake on us and i was mm -hmm. like wait a minute what the fuck i flew out the windshield when that happened dude i i, I couldn't i was like oh already there's no so extra imagine yeah he's gotta go through <laughs> just imagine how jarring it is as somebody who's read the book oh i can only imagine yeah, yeah. i mean it breaks the brain um and it's i mean you've taken out the core tension you really like i mean you really cut the legs out from this part of the story at some point i really wondered like why even bother you know with this storyline i i almost feel like 
this, you know, the way they approached it, it could have been done in 10 minutes, him joining the Fremen, him leading the army and him conquering and uh, killing Sting <laughs> in one of the most awkward hand-to-hand fights oh, uh, ever. Dude. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to go out there on a limb and say ever. Yeah. This was worse than the fight uh, between uh, King Kong and the snake. <laughs> Way worse. That was a, that was a cool fight. <laughs> Uh, for you <laughs> i did not like it <laughs> it was awesome okay <laughs> uh, i was that, not a fan but ha- i'm less of a fan of this it has a satisfying end though right when king kong snaps that thing's jaw and just like throws it on the ground like the beast he is and so here- believe believe it or not i actually was a little bit more satisfied with the ending of this not because of what happened like it it it, ha- it it was just like much of this movie it happened way too fast of how does this end uh and it it makes it seem like something's going to come into play it's like they have a setup in that fight and it doesn't really go anywhere he just is like oh i'm gonna get stabbed from this thing on his side and i've recognized it okay i'm just gonna take him down and stab him in his <laughs> stab him in the jaw you know it, it was very quick and jarring like much of this movie but what i appreciated about it was that it kind of like took me by surprise on how like sort of like creepy it was right immediately after that like paul says something and like not only does the ground crack underneath sting's Mm -hmm. dead body but then he like he like morphs a little bit like his eyes turn white and it's like his skin turns like a slightly different color and it it's like he just like decays right there it was it was pretty cool i thought that was like the coolest thing that had happened at it that is point the coolest the and i almost feel that that is the uh again the actual essence of paul's character arc from the book kind of shining through although i again i think it's misinterpreted here i think you are led to believe that he is like transcending to his status as a deity oh dude i felt he was a god at that point like i i i I, my understanding of the story was this movie was about essentially space jesus becoming space jesus (laughs) that's that was my interpretation of what dune is based on this movie and and his arc throughout and and how his power comes to be and everything like that that is why above all else above every other problem and misinterpretation here that we've talked about that is why dune fans reject this movie to this day i don't know of dune fans who come out and are a part of the reappraisal of this movie or of the cult following there might be some ironic enjoyment uh you're definitely more likely to um enjoy this movie in some in some serious way if you're a David Lynch fan, or if you're just a fan of, you know, kind of like art house cinema, the cinema of the weird, the cinema huh. of the bizarre. I mean, it's got that. Uh, it It's not the most uh, brazen uh, display of that. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, it is David Lynch on a leash. He's given more toys to play with. I guess it's nice to see what you know, Dune, uh, what, what David Lynch can do with uh, a budget of this scale, he would never work at this scale again. And he didn't want to. And I think he's probably a guy like so many other auteurs that actually benefits from the limits of resources rather than, you know, this blank check. Yeah. And I, I, I uh, real quick, I want to raise something before I forget about it. Cause it came up in my head a little earlier and I didn't have it in my notes. I wasn't going to prepare anything like this but there's another movie that came out in the 80s sir patrick stewart is also in that movie and i just want to i'm curious if you've seen it because i i feel like i want to make some comparisons about why one of them does sort of work for me and why this movie doesn't have you seen excalibur uh yeah i have (laughs) okay so not not a you know shining example of the of a fantastic film uh but Hmm here's what I thought when I watched Excalibur I like that movie uh I think there's some things that that are wrong with it don't get don't get me wrong there's some things there's problems but both of the movies have this sort of character fulfilling the destiny that the movie sets up for and both of them have this awkward passage of time uh that they just kind of glance over um both of them have a similar sort of progression of how the story works for itself but where i think excalibur works and this movie doesn't 
is Excalibur has enough throughout. There's enough substance throughout that keeps me engaged in the story and keeps me engaged in the action. And there's n not as much of that in the, like, like this. And, and I'm not questioning every decision made in Excalibur. I'm questioning some of them. I, I question a questioning. couple of decisions. Oh, no, Excalibur. certainly, certainly some of them. But like, I felt Honestly, like every though. couple of minutes I was questioning something about Dune. Why is this inner monologue thing so fucking awkward and terribly executed? Why are these characters saying these things or doing these things? What? Why did that happen so fast? <laughs> I was doing that like every few minutes. I would, I would argue that Excalibur deconstructs the myth of King Arthur more than uh, Dune deconstructs its own uh, I'd agree with that. leader. Which is, uh, that's not how that's supposed to happen. It, <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be saying that to you. I should not be uh, confessing that to you. Um, because I'm not even sure how intentional that is with Excalibur. I honestly think that it's part like some of the awkwardness, like you mentioned, contributes to that. But that is the final effect: is that uh, King Arthur is humbled, and right. is he a false leader? Uh, not exactly. He did pull that sword from that stone. You, you can never take that away from him. Right. But uh, he's not a. He's certainly not perfect, and he's not uh, a messiah character. He's he's complex. He's flawed. Uh, Colin McLaughlin with his with his fucking good looks like my god this is a photogenic man um <laughs> who you know he has a side chick he marries a princess he uh he fucks up sting it's like he's got everything going for him and then he transcends into godhood i mean it, it could not be more uh reverent of this character so and, and that's like a weird thing for david lynch like he he should not be going that route like that that should be um, antithetical to all of his instincts. So the idea that he would look at Dune, this book about a false prophet, you know, this is the guy who does, uh, he, he just did the elephant man. He should be about how um, prophets or, or, or high class or the golden people are actually gilded. And it's, it's uh, the fallen people, the, the weirdos, the freaks, like they're actually, you know, they're the people we should put on a pedestal. And I guess you could argue that some of what's going on with the Fremen, but it's still, it's Paul. You know, he's comes from this prestigious bloodline. He was literally bred to be perfect. And he's, he, he's perfecter than anyone could barely <laughs> imagine. He goes from being perfect to perfecter. That's, that's like yeah. his character arc. And that's weird. That's, I mean, that can't be David Lynch's doing. That can't be his idea. I I would imagine that's one of the, the things he might regret most about this whole thing. And that, I, it makes me wonder how much of, you know, how much of his vision was meddled with, you know? And, and if oh, this was an Incredibly example, so. you know, Incredibly if, so. if, this, if this was an example of that, I don't want to hold it against David Lynch, um, you know, but... Yeah, but I don't want to coddle him too much. Like, look, he, I mean, this was his third movie. I mean, he was, he was already an Academy Award nominated director. I, I feel like sometimes we talk about directors in these situations, like they're pretty, like they're helpless victims. Like, uh, no, I agree with that. Yeah. And, and I'm sure he did not have the full power. He was, he was beneath a power dynamic for sure. Um, but I mean, you know, he, I mean, I see his influence in a lot of ways in this movie. I mean, I can tell it's a David Lynch movie. So I'm just skeptical of the idea that, uh, that, that all of the bad ideas um, were forced on him, that all of the mistakes right. weren't his. I mean, he, and to be fair, he would never tell you that he owns up to the failure of this movie completely. It's very much like Sam Raimi and Spider-Man three. Uh, although I think Sam Raimi in that case is way too hard on himself for Spider-Man 3. Yeah, I mean, I, well, like, there are examples throughout history, you know, of directors, like, even if they do have studio interference, you know, like, one of one of the criticisms, we talked about Rob earlier, and he's another guy who who ran into a lot of studio interference, but one of the criticisms that I've heard that I can't really defend is that, you know, when he came back to do Halloween 2, um, they told him to do whatever he wanted and and sure they had control over the edit but he still went and complained about you know uh about his experience making halloween 2 um which was more, uh, 
interference in the production rather than creative interference. No, it, and it was, yeah. and it was, it was budgetary, but, you know, it was scheduling, things um, like that. And probably then, you know, even though they might say, we'll let you do whatever they want, uh, that doesn't mean they're going to support it right. or, or not, you know, pressure him in any ways. Uh, yeah, but I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of other classic examples, you know, like Wes Craven, after Nightmare on Elm Street, he does this movie, uh, Deadly Friend. Have you uh, seen that? I have never seen Deadly Friend, no. But you know about it? Do you know the uh, fable, the, I, the incredible story vaguely, of that movie? Vaguely, so he, yeah. he makes it as a little science fiction tragedy. And whoever produced that movie, it was not, I don't think it was New Line. No, it definitely wasn't because he was on the outs with them. But whoever did produce it, made him go back and turn it into a horror movie like he already made the oh. thing and they made him go back and reshoot so much of it to actually make it into something that resembled a slasher movie i was unaware of that um i i did not uh i did not know the lore of this um it, it looks like it was uh well warner brothers was one of the studios it says pan arts Layton and uh warner brothers so yeah, that sounds right. Who knows who did it, but <laughs> probably Warner Brothers. Um, but uh, I want to ask you about something. This is really the last thing I'll have to say, so <clears throat> I'm interested to see if, if there's anywhere else you'd like to take this. But um, we talked a little bit about how this story would have a hard time translating to a one film uh, and how you know there was a, a decent amount that was cut down from this. Um how did the length fare for you in this? You know, we've had a few movies that we've said were pretty excruciating to get through. We talked about Waterworld earlier in this, uh, you know, and that was one of those movies, uh, at least for me. It just felt incredibly long. Um, how did this one sit for you? Was this was this uh, a tough one to to get through? It was a chore to get through. It was a it was a chore. I it wasn't uh, painful. Um, so it wasn't Expendables three visits bad. It was, <laughs> it was wait, more so. Expendables three visits. Oh God, I know it. Okay, it took no. you, it took you, took you three times to get through that movie. It took me uh, three times to get through the Expendables. I mean, yeah. in that in that case, it wasn't painful. It was just tedious. I just felt like I, <laughs> I can be doing more productive things with my time than watching the Expendables. Um, uh, but there's a there's a real curiosity I have about Dune. There's a fascination there and. Uh, I, I don't want to call it a boring movie. I mean, it's a little too baffling to be boring, although it, it does verge on tedious at times. Uh, I don't know. I felt the length. I was glad that it wasn't three hours, although I guess that would have led to a more coherent movie. So it, I, maybe I'm wrong about that. But if, if this is anything to go off of, then uh, yes, I did feel the length. I am glad that this is an abridged version of Dune, even though it did ultimately sacrifice so much of actually what made Dune the great novel that it is. Glad to hear you say that because this is one of the longest fucking movies I've ever watched in my life. Okay. All right, I was <laughs> dude. Uh, yeah, you're going me, pretty let, hard. You're going no, I I hard. am going hard because I fully believe this. I so we've had a few movies. Battle Los Angeles is an example where I said like there was I was like okay yeah this movie's been like okay so far let's see where and I, and I had an hour left. Um, this I was like I was like we've got to be getting close to the end at this point. Uh, and I still had over an hour left of this movie. Let me tell you something. I said I broke a rule. I have a rule when I watch a movie. I give that movie my undivided attention i focus as much as i can i fell asleep watching dune how this is, is the first you can even control and also because how, what because time of night was it when you fell it was asleep? it was the morning i watched it this morning uh and and i i was already awake i had already eaten my breakfast <laughs> i was awake are you and saying I started this movie puts you to sleep it put me to sleep it put me to sleep i was watching it i was awake and i fell uh, my brain was like, dude, you got two choices right now. Abort mission or keep watching this. And it chose to abort mission. The reason I said I kind of finished this just before we went on is because I had to rewatch an entire section of this movie because I fell asleep during the last 40 minutes of it. And by the way, I am upset that I went back and witnessed the last 40 minutes of this movie. Okay. Hey, wow. I was yes. not, I was not expecting this. Okay. I'm going to make a bold statement when we get to our final verdict about watching this, but this is by far the longest feeling movie 
that I've ever watched for not that bad. No way it felt longer than Waterworld. It I don't felt longer that. than Waterworld. I yes. do not believe that. I think and I, it, and I, I checked even my watch every five minutes in Waterworld. And I even fucking I even admitted that a movie that I loved on this show was way too long in Godzilla 98. I admitted that. And I said it felt long. Knowing that that movie was longer than this, this still felt... If you would not have told me the length of this movie, I would have estimated... And I couldn't look at a, a wall watch or anything. I would have assumed I had watched this for at least four hours. I, it felt so long. I could not believe that... Like, I fit... Like, when I'm trying I, to I'm trying to figure out if you really believe this because this is dude, uh... I promise you <laughs> let me let me give you an, a full example of that when I woke up from this from from falling asleep watching this the movie had <laughs> had just ended and I know it had just ended because my phone had not gone dark yet but it was it was on the max screen for the end of this you know when when you finish were the movie you, on wait, max were you and it watching goes back. this on your phone uh yes i was oh wait wait that's no time out that's i that's had not to. cheating that's i that's... had to no no no. listen so i had to and let me tell you why i had to uh so <laughs> my wife was still asleep and we use a sound bar for our tv because the sound is is terrible the only problem with the sound bar is it projects really well so i either have to watch it with subtitles and barely any sound or i have to watch it on my phone now full full disclosure full disclosure <laughs> okay <laughs> before you before you lynch me here um before i david lynch you <laughs> yes um i uh i do frequently if if i if i am watching a movie that i'm experiencing for the first time i like to watch it in a different environment than i normally watch movies and the reason for that is because it, it keeps me aware i I, ha I can pay more attention to a movie if i have to pay more attention to it and when you're watching something on a mobile device you know, it's, it's not a huge screen, you know, you're holding it up. It's not a, it's not a big screen. Um, and even through that small screen, I could see how impressive the visuals were. There were a few times where I paused the movie on a frame. Cause I was like, wow, this like aged pretty well. Like this looks, this looks good. Yeah. We didn't um, even talk about the special effects, which feels weird. I mean, cause the special effects are the most uneven thing about the movie. Like some incredibly. shots yeah. hold up incredibly well. I think of the first appearance of the worm, which swallows up that, uh, uh that that mm -hmm. i guess factory the spice factory yeah um really immaculate like whoa whoa and then there's like blue screen garbage that either of us could you know replicate better just using photoshop now do you know so. what's frustrating about that though is like some of the blue screen work is like it like some of it does work well you know like when i was watching it the way i felt about the special effects in this i felt very similarly when we talked about supergirl you know there was some supergirl shots that i was like i would defend this against the superman movies let alone other movies at the that, time the special and, effects there just hold up i mean i i can barely but some of them dishes. oh man i mean like in supergirl I mean, I'm, I'm sure they were there. I'm just saying I don't remember them. I vividly okay. remember a lot of the really awkward blue screen effects. Uh, it, like it, when Paul is writing The Worm yes. for the first time. That Again, studying contrast. The sequence in which Paul first rides The Worm in Dune Part 2, that could be one of the most kind of awe-inspiring sequences shot for uh, cinema in, in the last couple of years. Like it was a okay. jaw-dropping sequence for me. Um, oh, cool. And it is awesome. on that on the strength of that sequence that I recommend, uh, I recommend everybody see it in a theater. Oh, cool. Uh, not exactly the effect, <laughs> not exactly the same, um, you know, magnitude in Dune 84, they tried. Uh, this is one of those things that were, I think David Lynch felt like he was not up to the task. It, it, it the whole visual aspect as far as like the uh like how the special effects looked in this it, it gave me the impression that that the director was either was either uh inexperienced with it or um maybe didn't maybe wasn't up to task <laughs> like maybe he wasn't maybe maybe he wasn't fully on board with with everything that he was doing and just kind of because again like even I, I I really like that you said that that's probably the most uneven thing about this movie because even thing even things that they do multiple times like a blue screen effect have moment you have moments where you're like wow that looks really good there's uh at towards the end of the movie when they're all kind of riding in on the worm uh there's this uh, shot yeah, that of was like okay. this 
green sky behind them and it blends really well with like the fog on the screen and the fog you know in front of them that they're going through it looked really cool and then literally two frames later they're riding on the worm again and it looked horrible uh and it was a shot in front of them instead of behind them i don't know if that had any effect you know the screen's not really moving behind them it's just kind of like a static sky and then all of a sudden they're moving towards something maybe that's what it was but it was so uneven that it would be like literally frames away from the last shot that we saw, you know, like barely any time has passed seconds since we saw this great shot. Um, it looks terrible now. Um, yeah, it, it's hard to give any this movie any compliments, honestly, because every compliment that I can give, um, I can immediately go to an example of it not working. Well, I mean, some movies are just, un I mean, we're talking about special effects. This was attempting to do some uh implement new technology or right. work on a and, pretty and it was scale. impressive i want to say that it was impressive on that uh note i i do i did feel like i was i didn't feel like i was watching a movie from 1984 you know maybe early 90s uh not 84 i, I thought that i mean don't get me wrong everything else about this movie is is you know 80s <laughs> but uh, the, as far as the visual effects go, like I felt like there are movies that come out after this that had a maybe a bigger budget or or had more time to put into their effects that were worse than what I saw in this movie. I'm not going to give you any examples. I can't think of them off the top of my head, but I know I've seen movies that have come out after this that look worse. Well, let me just end on something that I will compliment um, unequivocally, and that's the score. Uh, to Toto... A band for uh, a band known for you know the most overplayed song um, uh, it, of my personal opinion, which is Africa. They turn in a pretty damn good theme, and uh, there's another outfit here that's contributing music. I can't remember the name. Uh, it's another. Yeah, there 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 are a couple of interesting people on the soundtrack. Ironically, not I think Stink. The, I think the main theme. Like, so when I was watching the credits and I saw Toto, I was immediately like, what? But I think that they said, like, Toto did, like, put together the score as a whole. And then it said, like, main theme by... And then oh, Brian showed... Eno, I think? Uh, I, that could be it, yeah. Um, I think it's and, Brian uh, Eno. I'm going to look that up, make sure. Uh, but yeah, man, like, up with the main theme. There were moments in this movie that I was really impressed with the score that's the thing that didn't feel super uneven to me like it was uneven in a sense that he, it was une as uneven as any film score is i think you know there's always going to be some parts that you remember more than others there's always going to be some parts that are meant to be more background than the focus to help you know complement the scene um besides the things that i said i liked the best about the movie before this is, this is easily number two if i if the visuals are number one for me this is mm -hmm. the the easiest number two i could possibly say yeah, and it's something that I prefer about this Dune over Villeneuve's Dune. I prefer this to Hans Zimmer's score, uh, believe it or not. Okay, uh, I'm I'm not going to shit on you for that. I'm not one of those like you know people who thinks Hans Zimmer can do no wrong. You know, I I don't I I think he's tremendous, but you know, there's a uniqueness to this score that you don't get. Uniqueness, now. and it's not trite in the way that, frankly, the kind of uh, world music uh, approach of Hans Zimmer's score you know there's a lot of like uh vocalizing and a lot of like kind of like I guess attempts to evoke Middle Eastern ah, um, okay kind of um soundscapes because of the sand because <laughs> of the sand well because I mean honestly and, and we didn't even touch on any of the political implications here but uh you know in Villeneuve's book and this is probably truer to the uh to the uh, allegory of dune you know the fremen are are you know brown they are you know Z yeah. zendaya and they are they are not white you know they are an allegory for Isn't batista in that movie too although he's not playing uh uh, uh he's not playing a fremen he's playing the uh actual uh, what are they they're uh what do you call people who are all white albino uh, albino he's playing an albino man oh cool so that's that's funny but love batista him yeah. and he's a he's not a huge part in those movies but uh he he's cool to see but in this uh, yeah right in this dune 84 they are all white the fremen are all white they are <laughs> uh snowy white they're pale as hell uh they're just living out there in the as dunes. is this entire movie 
Yeah. They're living out there in the dunes under the the beating sun, not a cloud in the sky, and they are just as uh, they would blend into a snowstorm. They are all <laughs> white. <laughs> Which, so, like, I'm not going to hold that against a movie from this time period. I understand how that goes, but uh, it's, it's kind of jarring it's to awkward. see the difference. It's yeah. awkward. Now, what I will say is the only saving grace here is that it prevents this from being a white savior story. I think yeah. actually, if this were a story about a white boy, like, you know, Kyle McLaughlin, like becoming the God over <laughs> uh, a Brown tribe in, you know, in the desert, you know, this movie would, would be, be crucified today. Head, oh head my God. Explode. So thankfully this isn't a white savior story. It's just a savior story. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, white people helping each other out. <laughs> what is the opposite of white on white crime? I don't know. Um, it's whatever this. It's Dune white nationalism. Uh, you know. It's, oh shit. Anyways, uh, it's Dune eighty four. That's what that. Uh, that's what that is. But uh, oh boy, um, is there? I mean, we we touched on a whole lot about Dune so far. Um, yeah, I'm really. Is there anything to cover our bases here? I mean, it's, it, yeah. Even if this is a difficult movie to watch, it's an amazing movie to talk about. And, yeah, I mean, you know. it's a good conversation. Like, I'm glad I've seen it. You know, I'm glad I've seen it now and that I can bring it up, especially when I do actually finally get around to seeing the the two Dune movies. Uh, you know, I know I make a joke about the fact that I don't see anything now. It hurts me <laughs> quite tremendously that I that I don't see anything. I can't talk about any new movies with anybody, and it and it sucks. Um, but you know, that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Uh, I'm glad that I can, you know, add this to conversations that I have about, especially sci-fi. I think sci-fi is a very interesting genre. It's had very periods of, of very high ups and very low downs. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm excited to add this to my Rolodex of, uh, of sci-fi films to, uh, to have conversations like this about, um, and, and I'm excited uh, for you. You yeah, tell I mean, people about how you fell asleep. How I fell asleep uh, watching movie. Dune. How Dune put me to sleep. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna have to start watching this at night when I'm having trouble sleeping. I'll just, I'll just throw Dune on, but I'll like skip ahead to like you know after the first like hour and a half. See, and I just... okay, you're actually making me change my verdict. Uh, <laughs> oh shit! So is it because I'm being too harsh? Let's just get into the, yeah, the final verdict, and then uh, I'll go ahead and dive in because uh, you you have made me realize that I don't hate this movie, that I don't dislike this movie as much as I thought. Because okay, uh, I can't I can't go there with you. I can't you know this movie didn't put me to sleep. Um, it's it's not it's a movie that uh, I I can compliment unequivocally. It's not like not every praise I have piece of praise I have comes with an asterisk that being said i can't endorse this fully as a dune adaptation or a david lynch movie i can say that there is uh there's camp value uh there's yeah. the makings of a, a cult not a classic but a cult uh a, a, a piece of interest <laughs> for that crowd for the the crowd of, of midnight movie enjoyers people who can who can uh who can laugh at this movie or be enamored by the weird uh, circumstances surrounding this movie. You know, it, it, it's a movie that is too weird to kill. You can't put it out of your mind. I know I can't. And history can't forget it either. You know, it's a movie that um, flopped and it flopped hard and it should have killed careers and it didn't. It actually, you know, gave David Lynch a second wind. And now people are going back to it and remembering it uh, fondly it's very interesting the lifespan that this movie has had although obviously you know to most people it's that weird probably really bad first attempt at making a dune movie so i thought i might come down on our harshest verdict but through you um because i know where you're gonna land i actually uh I, I can say I'm more lenient and I'm more forgiving. And I want to say for all of its, it, it, its bizarre flaws, that it's still a movie worth watching, worth experiencing, because uh, there's not another movie like it. Uh, and there is too much talent involved to ignore. So it's not that bad. Okay. 
the namesake of the show. Uh, I'm glad to hear you fall on that verdict, uh, despite my thoughts, which I'll get into uh, my, my final verdict here. Um, this is not the worst movie that I've watched for Not That Bad. But it was the worst experience of watching a movie that I had for Not That Bad. Um, I did not think it would be easy to top Waterworld. Um, and I don't think this movie's worse than Waterworld, to be truthful with you. Um, I think it has more going for it. Uh, but, and, and I want to say full disclosure, I can see my opinion turning around somewhat on this movie. It will never be something that I revisit often. At this moment, I have no desire to watch it again. Um, but I think the reason that, that I think this movie has potential to turn around for me at some point is because there's enough interesting there that I, I feel more compelled to seek out um, other people's thoughts on this. I feel compelled to go to YouTube and look up other people talking about Dune. What, what are their problems with it? What do they like from it? Um, I don't know how many people are talking about it or have talked about it, but I, I want to seek that out now. Um, and that maybe one day this will be a movie that I'll revisit and, you know, I'll be able to turn around at least some of my issues that I have with it. For now, gun to my head, I'd rather watch Waterworld. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to watch this again more than, more, more than likely. Um, I, I do not think it is the absolute worst example of, of a sci-fi movie or a David Lynch movie or anything like that. I, I think this is, this will have some value to people out there and it has all the makings of a cult movie. Um, but a 2.8 is, is very fair for me. Um, I think this, uh, is, is actually, that's much higher than I would give it. Um, I'm going to say this movie is that bad. Worse even. Well, that sounds like you would give it a worse. I would give it a worse rating. I'm not going to say what I'd give it. I don't want to contribute to any sort of hate train on this movie, because again, I do think there's a lot here that you can grab and that you can highlight like dude when i looked at the poster for this i was like i hope i love this because i'd love to put that poster up on my wall uh it's beautiful but um unfortunately it just didn't it just didn't do for me what i hoped it would um part of this was probably my expectations i did my best to manage them um but uh you know here we are uh and i i hate that i've landed here but that's that's where i'm gonna be for now well, what an interesting episode. Uh, we, we've come yeah. away with uh, a more contrasted uh, set of opinions. And hopefully through this discourse, people can, I guess, parse out their own feelings about this movie. Because I don't think anybody has a simple opinion on this. Not if they look at this movie really objectively. I mean, you can hate it as a Dune adaptation. I get that. But uh, if you take this movie on its own terms, I think you're going to wrestle with a lot of conflicting emotions. I mean, even you and your, you know, disparaging remarks, you did acknowledge things that it has going for it. And while uh, it does hurt to see you put any David Lynch movie below Waterworld, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I can't. I'm sure I'm going to get crucified for that, by the way. You're not going to get crucified, but uh, I think. Yeah, I think it's a testament to the fact that the movie just did not work for you. And maybe you went right. in with with higher expectations. I expect if you rewatch it and remember um, how it put you to sleep, you might be pleasantly surprised that it at least, you know, kept you awake on the <laughs> rewatch. We might revisit this one day. We'll see. But for right now, yeah. uh, that is uh, it for David Lynch's Dune. Uh, it is available on Aero Video for people who want to go check it out and really uh, dive into the special features and try to figure out the history of this bizarre production. I wish that there was a really candid documentary about the making of this, but that would require David Lynch's involvement and he wants nothing to do with the movie. So it is going to remain a myth, uh, just like the myth of the, you know, of, of the Fremen and the Muad'Dib and the coming <laughs> one. It, it's going to be a movie whose reputation lives on more than the film itself for better and for worse. Uh, yeah, we will be returning with uh, a movie that is nothing like this one. We're going <laughs> to go to a completely different. Holy shit. Uh, uh, we're, we're doing a whole new ball game for our new episode. So it was fun to talk Ooh. about sci-fi and David Lynch and all of that. Uh, Cause we're actually, I would describe the next movie we're talking about as being a piece of uh, American surrealism. Would you not? Um, dude, uh, to the highest extent, to the highest <laughs> I, extent. I think, I think, 
I, I think people describe, are going to be surprised by this next pick. I would describe our next pick as being more Lynchian than this <laughs> actual David Lynch movie we talked about. Dude, this next movie may break us, uh, our minds, everything. Uh, I, I, I'm very excited for this, and I'm glad if we're teasing I it here. Hadn't grown up with that movie, you might be right, but I think I think uh, the movie did changed my brain chemistry as a as a young child so yeah and i only saw the movie once as a kid i've seen it yeah. more uh in <laughs> late teens and adulthood than i have as a kid so okay. i am very very excited about this um we're kind of laying it out i don't want to get too deep into it but uh folks thank you so much for listening to this episode hopefully we'll see you in the next one which i am very 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 excited about uh in the meantime though if you want to keep track of us you want to look up on your boys here at not that bad uh you got a couple ways you can do it of course liking subscribing sharing commenting even leaving a review on podcasting platforms however you like to take in the show Uh, we would love to hear from you we'd love to have you join uh in in corporate speak the not that bad family um and uh you can find all those links and more on our website not that bad uh it's got bios about us like i said links for all of our platforms that we post on and it even has a backlog of all of our former episodes most of which contain youtube links um, but it is broken up by season, so you can kind of follow us from our be- our humble beginnings at the beginning of season one, um, what was originally not even going to be season, it was just going to be the show, uh, but now here we are in season two. Um, but uh, what else can they do if they want to support us, uh, uh, L.A. Gabe? <laughs> not for long, I got to get it out yeah. while I can. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess I'll be... Uh... Gabe EST, Gabe EST, time. <laughs> the Gabest uh, in, in the new, uh, <laughs> the Gabest. It's actually pretty good. Uh, yeah, I mean, they can, of course, support us on Patreon, where we offer exclusive content, uh, where people can get Patreon specials on some of our most uh, fascinating topics, some of our most fascinating movies, uh, months before they ever uh, get released to, uh, you know, the rest of, uh, of our audience and they can also get exclusive merch they can get that warm feeling inside of supporting <laughs> independent creators which really can you even put a price tag on that yes you can give us your money all right give thanks y'all to us so much real quick <laughs> before we take out the show i just want to bring up one thing i did not tell gabe about this but i'm sure he will be supportive uh before we take it out uh, and those of you who who no longer want to listen can uh definitely tune out at this point but I'm sure uh, at this point that we're recording, one of the hot button topics right now is a recent release of a documentary on Max called Quiet On Set. Mm. Um, Quiet On Set uh, details some of the experiences of child actors on Nickelodeon programs through the 90s and early 2000s. Um, very, very difficult but important watch in my mind. Um, And uh, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because I think it's important when things like this come out to not only educate ourselves and not only uh, make sure that we know at least the base amount of information, but also make sure that we are showing support to those who uh, share their experiences and stories that give us a better understanding of how maybe we can be better uh, ourselves as people, but also to help foster better environments uh, in worlds like film, which over the last uh, five to six years has uh, taken a beating from uh, abuse scandals and things of that nature. Um, so just wanted to uh, make sure we are not affiliated anyway with Max the pro uh, the, or any of the people who made uh, that program. I did reach out to a few of the people who were in the documentary, but uh, they did not have anything to uh, plug or support so it besides themselves as people or their own personal projects and such so um, if you give the documentary a watch uh, be sure to uh, go around to um, those who shared their experiences and show your support um, if you could whether it's just you know doing what you do for us liking and, and taking in their content or even just giving them a follow on social media um, things like that can go a long way. Um, so uh, thank you, Gabe, for letting me go on my little diatribe there. I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add. You sure can. Um, but uh, if not, you can uh, definitely take us out.
Well, I was going to end on a joke, but that doesn't seem like the most appropriate uh, <laughs> follow-up. So yeah, um, kind of kind of killed the mood there. We're going to take us out on a somber uh, and respectful note. Uh, yeah, but absolutely, especially if you um, are in our generation, if you grew up on those shows, I think it yeah. is going to be a very sobering watch. And you know, as somebody who you know is trying to be in this industry of entertainment um, and really trying to wrestle with a lot of unfortunately the the corruption and the uh and the scandals that plague this industry i think being aware of it no matter who you are and uh, taking any stand against it in any way whether it be uh with the programs you support people you support um and just making your voices heard through social media uh you really can't underestimate the power and influence that uh that has so uh, thanks to Connor for bringing that up. I haven't seen the documentary yet, uh, but uh, I know how important it is and it's already started some really uh, essential conversations. Yeah. So uh, again, respectfully taking us out. <laughs> uh, talking about Dune 1984. I know, uh, I know. I, I, bad timing. <laughs> bad timing. We'll bring it up at the end of the next episode too because uh, then the next thing we are covering is uh children's content from the 2000s so we'll be sure if i if i learn anything else about resources to share i'll do so but uh yeah for now uh weird weird note to take us out on my bad <laughs> uh actually it's a great plug for our next episode didn't even make that connection uh <laughs> yeah yeah please join us as we talk about another piece of uh, children's entertainment you know on that note here's the documentary about uh, how terrible child actors had it in the early 2000s yeah all right, so until next time, guys, I'm Thing One. I think two. <laughs> this is uh, not that bad. Uh, signing out.